Welcome to the first episode of the Dawn Debates. Much of what we see on social media these days has too much heat, but not enough meat. So if you are hungry for a researched, respectful exchange of ideas, you have come to the right place. So here's the format. Speaker one is going to get five uninterrupted minutes to explain his opinion. Speaker two then gets three minutes to ask questions. Speaker two will then get his five uninterrupted minutes, followed by three minutes of questions from speaker one. Both sides are going to get a final two minutes each to summarize their argument. Time will be strictly adhered to. So here's how you will know. I am going to show you the yellow card when you have one minute left. And when you're getting within the final 30 seconds, you will get the red card. Please note that I will mute microphones when you are at the end of your time. Our debaters today are New Brunswick Premier Blaine Higgs and public policy consultant and author of the Sir Robert Bond Papers, Ed Hollett. Premier Higgs' government quickly responded to COVID-19 with a province-wide state of emergency on March 19th. Less than a week later, they closed their borders to unnecessary travel. Interestingly, they've also had one of the lowest per capita incidents of COVID-19 in the country. On Mr. Hollett's side, on June 1st, he published a blog stating that new restrictions imposed by the government of Newfoundland and Labrador have been politically rather than medically motivated. This promises to be a very interesting and informative discussion. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, John. Nice to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm very excited. This is going to be a great discussion. Um, so without further ado, Premier Higgs, uh, just let me start my time clock here. And your five minutes to make your, uh, your opening remarks. Thank you, Don. Um, I guess, you know, starting in this, this uh, COVID situation was certainly unique to, to all of us. I, I came with a philosophy. I, I have a long uh, career in the business world. I came to, to, to uh, politics about 10 years ago now. But with the philosophy that we can do better, we can make better decisions, we can get better results for the money we spend, and, and that there would never be enough money or revenue in the system to, to support the continued demands and needs of, of individuals, unless we came with a, with a new formula of how we get results for value of, of money spent. Uh, internationally, you know, we had a budget that we put forward that was kind of a, I, I guess, a, a, a too good to be true budget in many ways, because we, we dealt with many social issues. We had a a surplus, we were paying down our debt, and no new taxes. And, and it, was, uh, it was really good. The, it was passed within 17 minutes because of the, the COVID situation. Within three weeks, it's kind of irrelevant uh, with what has happened. So that puts us into the new reality. We, we never did completely close down. You referenced that we, we did uh, close our borders. We did to mm -hmm. commercial traffic only. Uh, but in terms of businesses, we went back to about 26% roughly. But we have a lot of big, uh, stable businesses that, that continue to run and continue to manage, and the commercial traffic continued to move. Um, so we've seen um, now, uh, as we've man managed our borders, all of our cases have been related to travel. So trying to contain our borders has been paramount for us, and now we're starting to, to open up. In our changes we made in the last week, two weeks, three weeks in that range, we've gone, um, according to our CFIB, from about 26% to a 64% opening with businesses being, being uh, fully open. So we're on a ramp up and my concern, my biggest concern is that many of the discussions I have, whether it be federally uh, or interprovincially are related to today only. And we're not looking at the next five or 10 or 15 years. And I'm very concerned of what we have for a province and a country, um, you know, five or 10 years from now. So my goal is uh, every decision has to reflect the reality of today, but it has to more importantly and as importantly, reflect what we need to do for tomorrow. So we're not surprised next year. I'm concerned about federal transfers in future years because there's so much money being spent. Uh, we evaluate every business. It's not a matter of just, do we hand out money everywhere? It's, it's how do we look at businesses and their survival, but how do we look at their ability to grow their business or were they kind of on the bubble always and this just maybe put them over the edge. So none of the decisions are made arbitrarily. None of the decisions are being made because this is a demographic that people are in. Uh, they are being based on the reality of a, a path for our province for a long-term view and a long-term vision. And getting back as quickly as we can to a, a, a sustainable path forward, no new taxes, and ultimately, you know, I wanted to reduce the tax burden on citizens. I want to free up private money to put into our system because I'm very focused on private investment. 
versus public investment in uh, in economic development. So I'm um, this situation has caused us to do things very differently. We set up a COVID cabinet committee that was all party leaders, which was very unique in the country. It worked very well to make decisions related to the pandemic. And now as we open up our economy, you know, we continue to operate as a, as a and I meet weekly with my, my counterparts in the other parties. And that has been working out well. And, and yes, we will have challenges and there are, there are signs of cracks in the armor and likely it'll, uh, it won't last uh, forever. Uh, but it has helped us make the right decisions for the province thus far, for all over the province. And that's, a, that's very, very exciting. I am convinced that we, we've learned things in this while, and we did that. I'll use a clear example of that. Our ALC patients are in hospitals. We were many, many years even having situations where we couldn't find the appropriate uh, facility in nursing homes and long-term facilities for these individuals that needed a better location. And we found out Within two months, we moved 200 people to alternate locations and put them in the, the places that they really should have been all along. We found out that we got across uh, departments because we weren't operating normally. We, we were pulling people from all different departments to bring skill sets in to get the job done. Our focus was getting the job done. I am absolutely adamant that we're not going back to where we came from. Uh, we're gonna take lessons learned and I could go on about those and we're gonna build on them, not just say we're back to normal. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Premier Higgs. That was an interesting discussion. I, I saw Mr. Holland taking some notes there. So I uh, guess you're, you're well and ready to pose your three minutes of questions. If you could just give me one second to reset the timer. Okay, Mr. Hollett, your three minutes starts now. I think the first thing I have to say is Premier Higgs people are gonna find this is probably a lot less of a debate than they hoped for. Um, <laughs> because we're, we're gonna be in wild agreement or, or, or vehement uh, agreement more often than not. My first question is actually very simple. How did you decide to, to, to close the borders or what, was the, what prompted you to close down the borders to the extent that you did? And related to that, if you could explain to us please what, um, what you, how you determined essential travel. So it, it turned out initially with us, when we had the March break. So our March break was a little earlier. We watched mm -hmm. the pandemic coming from, you know, around the world, of course, uh, originating in China. But, but we saw, we had school kids that were traveling to Italy and Italy was in an outbreak at that point. So we, we actually, and, and we have a member minister that's very focused on the international events and, and kind of the viruses that have spread in the past. We focused on, the, and he's our minister of education. In any case, these students that came back, we said, look, we're not bringing them back into class. We, we're, 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 we'll isolate them when they get home, we're not bringing them back. And then a week later, we closed schools. And then we recognized that the bulk of problems were created through travel. And, and the only way we could control anything was having control on travel. So the essential services became, you know, and they're controversial ones, they became commercially sensitive. So, so truckers coming in, bringing in goods and supplies, so obviously the case. Medical supplies, medical individuals, you know, we've had medical professionals go across borders. So they were travel, but, but family commute travel for visitation, uh, for social gatherings. I mean, it became an issue with nursing homes and such because, you know, and it became very sensitive because loved ones in nursing homes, but nursing homes were one of the biggest areas of concern. So we had to just put the clamps on them and we did. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't easy. But we recognize if we didn't control travel, we could not control the virus. One minute. Real quick question then, I guess since we only have one minute. Um, what do you see as the pressing challenge then five years out? You talked about making a decision for today, but keeping five and 10 years out. What would be the one most pressing thing that you would, you would, you would see in that period? I'm concerned and I, uh, I'm a province here that has 30% of its revenue from transfer payments. And, and I'm very concerned about the future of those transfer payments. When I'm on these calls every week uh, with my colleagues and then with the Prime Minister, and I'm watching a, a, an economy like Alberta that has completely collapsed, and, and where's that gonna go in the future? And they've been a major re revenue source for the federal government. I'm thinking, where's the money gonna come from here going forward? I'm not proud of being a 30% recipient, but I depend on it. And, and was I working my way to get out of it? Over time, it would have been a, a while, but that was our goal. So I'm saying, and I brought this up in a recent, recent uh, meeting uh, nationally, was what about next year? What, where's the money gonna come from that keeps the formula whole for next year? 
And that's why I'm very cognizant of not just throwing money out across the province because I'm telling businesses, I'm telling employees, I'm telling the citizens, do you want to pay more taxes next year? Is, is that because where do you think I get this money? And, and, and the businesses, yeah, uh, it'll come right back at you. If I start sending money out now, it's going to come right back at you in the future from whether it's my government or another government because we have no other source. So let's just be prudent. And I've seen business owners really cranking it up. I, I've watched them come back, watch the socialists because they don't want to be shut down. They don't want to cause an outbreak and, and the causes to shut down. They're really being part of the solution. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of that and excited. Thank you very much, Mr. Premier. And uh, Mr. Holly, it's now turning over to you for your five minutes. I've got two blocks of time, so I'm going to use it this way. I'm going, to, I'm going to spend the first five minutes talking about what I see are the challenges or issues or problems that we face. And then in the second five minutes, I'm going to talk a bit about some ideas that I, I think the Premier and I are probably going to agree on, uh, but that are going to be important going forward. Um, the Premier pointed out, and I think takes good credit for, as his colleagues across the country can take credit for, acting very quickly and very effectively to respond to an emergency that was overwhelming in some respects. Um, some aspects of it were things that we had never seen before, but it's an emergency like others, and we had a lot of governments across Canada have a lot of rehearsed uh, procedures to deal with that. Um, the Premier did, I think, a, a commendable job, as his colleagues did a commendable job. Very quick to respond, but unfortunately, as we got to the other side of it, and in Newfoundland and Labrador, we actually crossed over the other side of it very quickly. Some governments have been very slow to identify that fact and have been very slow to respond. And that's, I'm particularly speaking here in Newfoundland and Labrador, which has been doing its thing for its own reasons. And I think that's where the problem comes, is that we're having this uneven development and uneven, uneven uh, recovery, even though in Atlantic Canada generally, we've probably, we're probably in a very good shape. I think there were some encouraging discussions amongst the premiers about an Atlantic bubble. We'll talk about that a bit in the second five minutes, hopefully. But what I want to emphasize is that this whole strategy that the governments have had for dealing with pandemics from the beginning, and we've heard this phrase now, is not just about flattening the curve, but about living with COVID, which means living with COVID. We've had in this initial round um, a sense that government, or the, from some people in the, in the community as a whole, that we have to go to zero cases before we can do anything. I don't think that's really going to be successful. Our strategy assumes that we actually have active cases in the community. As long as our hospitals and long-term care are safe, we should carry on about our business as best we can while taking some sensible precautions. I think that's where what the problem has been and where the challenge has been. In governments in Canada, unfortunately, I don't think particularly in, in my province, have been quite as nimble and as flexible and as agile coming out of the COVID uh, first wave as they were going in. I think we have symbolically of that, and the border closings in Newfoundland and Labrador's case are symbolic of the love of barriers in between provinces and trade barriers though. So we have a great deal of inertia and a tendency to be, um, to push, uh, to, to keep things the way they are. Um, and I think that's a challenge we face very significantly. Um, and we have collectively a challenge here for to change government, um, which is what's been holding us back. This has a very real impact on, on, on Canadians generally and on people in the Atlantic region specifically. Um, just before we, we started recording this, uh, Royal Bank of Canada released its most recent estimate. And the forecast is that the economy in Newfoundland and Alberta is going to shrink by about 10% this year, in New Brunswick by about 5.3%. Nova Scotia about by, by about 5.6. That problem is going to be, that, that shrinking is going to be made worse if we don't get the recovery part right and we don't move swiftly and nimbly and agilely to reopen the economy and allow people to get back to work, doing the things they need to do, providing essential services to the people in New Brunswick and the people in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, and Labrador, that we need every day, whether it's haircuts for people who are follically challenged like me or in many cases, important healthcare. And I think that's, that's where we've got to be very concerned. It has an economic impact and a health impact. And as much as COVID would be disaster if it was allowed to run rampant, we have the other side of that, which is that if we don't recover cleanly, if we don't look forward 
and understand that we have to live with COVID, meaning we have to live functionally as we did in the past, but with some new conditions, we're going to suffer greatly in the future. Now, that didn't take me five minutes to say, um, and it's a lot easier to say than it is to fix, but I think that's the frame of where I'm coming from. We have some problems with bureaucracy. We have some problems with inertia in Canada. Anyway, governments like to keep things the way they are. And the challenge is then how to move forward. So Mr. Premier, uh, you'll get the opportunity to uh, ask some questions now. And uh, actually, I think we need to unmute your microphone. I think you have to, there you go. You're good on your side. Okay, Mr. Premier. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Harlan, I, I agree. Opening up is, is the big challenge. And we have, um, we've started to, I'd like to thank aggressively do that in, in timelines and blocks of two, two and three weeks. We had identified the phases previously so people knew when it was coming, when the time was right. Um, I agree totally that we have a life with COVID. We have a life with cases. We've been, you know, uh, somewhat challenged or, or questioned about uh, opening up the province when we have the situation in the northern part of the province that, that's its particular long care home. But, but we've, we've said, look, we were going to go in with a group and we were going to test uh, in, in great numbers if we had a regional approach, but we were not going to shut down the rest of the province. We were going to keep it moving. So, so I guess, uh, you know, thinking if it's, if it's my turn to ask a question, um, in, in relation to what you see is how we live with COVID. What do you think is, is realistic for the restrictions that, that, that we just are going to be a way of life and that we have businesses and people get on with it and that, you know, that particularly relates to school opens and daycares uh, because that's the area that people are this fall are going to be very susceptible and wondering, do I dare send my kid to school? Should I continue to stay home? I'm of the mind, we just got to get on with it. I, I tend to agree. Um, uh, and I have sort of, a, I have the luxury of living in Newfoundland and Labrador where we are now been about six weeks since we've had, uh, or sorry, it's about a month, sorry, about four weeks since we've had local transmission related to travel. The last case that was, was announced publicly is a single traveler and there's been no subsequent transmission. So we could all be down here dancing around naked singing, you know, kumbaya you know, in a, in a, in a, in all in the one spot and nobody's going to get COVID because the disease really isn't active. The challenge we face, and I, and this is where I think we're in violent agreement is that once we ease up the border restrictions and you have that opportunity to come in, the challenge comes to do two things. First of all, we've got to have the public health facilities to be able to identify, contain and trace. But the second thing is, and it's actually, I think getting people used to the idea that you'll carry a, a, a mask in your pocket, you carry a set of gloves around with you, you'll keep your physical distance from people, um, in some instances and not, and getting people used to the idea that sometimes the public health authorities are gonna say in Bathurst, you're locked down, but in Dieppe, not so much a problem. And that we'll see these sort of variations. I think that's what life might look like but it's actually public acceptance that's gonna become the most significant challenge uh, mm -hmm. to this idea because they're, they're scared to death, I think still, from the, the, for exactly what you pointed out at the beginning, which is the images of the, of the, 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 uh, the, the tragedy in Italy or, or more recently in the United States. That, I, and I agree, we're seeing that right here in the, in, so the Hamilton region with this issue and we're seeing other parts of the province say, oh, we don't want anyone from Hamilton coming to, coming to our region. Well, if they come, we're saying we'd prefer people would, would stay local until we get this sorted out. Uh, and that, that is our recommendation. But, but to your point of taking the equipment with you, wearing a mask, you know, protecting yourself as well as others, uh, we can only open the province up if, if that is the way that people respond. And I think that's a must. Going right to the, the school situation, what, what are your thoughts about the school openings and what type of restrictions should or uh, should apply? I'm going to have to cop out to the to the I'll take advice from the doctors on this one because I think there and that's that's going to be a challenge everywhere. Public health is not really settled yet. Uh, the doctors have not really settled on whether or not it's a it, this is a major issue for for children, uh, for people under the age of 18 who are in grade schools, which is particularly what we're concerned about. 
Um, at the university level, I think we've seen a great deal of adaptation. It's certainly going to be happening at UNB. It's happened at Memorial. It'll happen at Dalhousie and, and, and Kings and wherever else. Uh, we can, they can do this kind of thing that we're doing here. My daughter's done it. My son did it. Uh, we all do teleconferencing. But in school, I think we're going to have a bit of a challenge there. And again, it's going to be more a case of educating parents and getting parents comfortable with the idea that kids can mix and mingle and it isn't the problem. It's those of us who are older uh, that might have to have some kind of restrictions placed on us in terms of access to schools. So I, I don't know what it means, simply put, but I think it's I, going to be. So I'm going to interrupt here just to say we've gone well beyond the, the three minutes that was allotted for the Q&A portion on, on this side. Um, and uh, Ed had alluded to having two blocks of five minutes each, which was actually supposed to be a five minute block and a two minute summary. But I'm gonna go with that, we're gonna fly. So I'm gonna give the premier five minutes to both you know, explore ideas on, on reopening the economy and where we're going from here, and also to use that time as your summary as well. So it'll be a, I guess a joint discussion in, in, the, in your five minutes, and then we'll allow Ed the same five minutes on his side of things. Okay, well, what I would like to do is, is continue on the theme about education. And the reason primarily is that with the kids going back to school, it's important to, 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 to get it functional so that the parents have, are able to go back to work. And, and the challenge in school, of course, is what, what comes home. Not, I think the risk of school kids is, is, is minimal, as we seem to have seen across the world. But, but the idea of transmission from school kids back into the family uh, is, is real. So, so thinking about the startup and thinking about how we live with COVID, I, I want to kind of throw out this and get uh, get Ed's uh, comments on, the, on the, this point. But, but let's think about the, the, the those at risk. So, those at risk have, have been identified as as maybe sixty plus, and and the degrees of risk, um, you know, heighten this uh, the older you get. So, so when you think of that, and you think about okay, well, the working class are basically, you know, um, let's say 60 minus or, or less than 60 years old and, and, uh, or 65 and under. So, so if you think about let the working class getting up and running and, and you think, okay, well, we have an obligation. And I use we because I'm in the 60 plus category, a little farther along than I will talk about in this session. Um, but but I, I think about maybe it's, it's a situation where we have to think about in the 60 plusers uh, how do we protect ourselves? How do we be cognizant of when we're moving around in the community and when we're meeting with family and potential friends and that we, you know, have maybe been associating with others or out in the working world? And how do we isolate in that sense to allow the, the, con the economic development side of, of our recovery? And that, are, that are, would be those individuals, let's say 65 and under, uh, get on with life. And, and absolutely just get moving. And so we take a responsibility ourselves uh, at, in this age group to, to make, a, to make a, an obligation one to another that we are going to find ways to protect ourselves and others that we would most normally associate with so that we can get on with the economic development. So I'm, I'm kind of giving that aspect some thought because I think that then puts shifts the onus and it shifts the, the, uh, the exposure um, to our economy growing in a way that just has to get on with it because the risk is less for those individuals. So I, I'm not taking the, the full five minutes either for that, but I'd like to go because I feel it plays a big role in our economic growth and, and movement. Okay, over to you. Okay. Let, let, me, let me first of all respond to that and pick up on that thread. I think actually, Premier, you've, you've hit on what I think is, is one of the most challenging but one of the most workable and viable approaches to take, which is for governments to trust the public, to trust ordinary citizens like me, uh, who are not that far behind you in age, um, to take a few simple rules and apply them into our own situation successfully. So that I can deal with my mother who's in her 80s, mm -hmm. uh, my sister who has, is in a vulnerable category, and the people in my own family who are in vulnerable categories in, in my own house, and carry about my life so that we will have this and we'll be able to work it out ourselves. I think that's one of, and that's gonna be a challenge because you know, I'm sure you've experienced it. I experienced it in my earlier life. There's a tendency to want to overmanage and micromanage gov uh, from government into the public. What happens if we take the rules, if we take those rules away, oh my God, anarchy will follow. And I think that's a challenge. Actually, it's probably a challenge more for politicians in some cases more than it is for the public servants. I think that's a challenge. 
what I wanted to put out there in, in, in as one of my ideas, and I mentioned free trade before, I think one of the most exciting ideas that we've had for going forward is the notion of a regional bubble, as much as I hate the term bubble. I think the idea that's been floated and that the four Atlantic premiers are working on of having some kind of freer movement just amongst the four of us is a tremendous positive step forward if you can get it. I know Premier here hasn't been particularly keen on it, but I was in a session yesterday with your colleague from PEI and he was quite hopeful and hopefully we'll have a great announcement. But I think that's a good, uh, that's a good step forward if we can do that and learn to trust each other and cooperate more. The advantage to that though is I, I'll go a step beyond when you talk five years out. Maybe it'll help deal with your, your dependence on, um, on Ottawa, is that if we opened up to a greater irrelevant of free trade, in, this, in addition to that op more open travel between the four provinces, we could see the sort of economic growth out of the, five, the two million of us in Atlantic Canada that would help us all get forward. Um, that sort of regional cooperation, if we can extend that in the same way that our counterparts in, in the four Western provinces have some level of economic cooperation, I think, I think that's a tremendous way forward. So in a perverse way, it would be taking the kind of uh, panic that we saw at the beginning of COVID as, as barriers internal to your government broke down, departments started realizing they have to work together. If we can figure out some way in a perverse way to make that work and knock down the barriers and the institutional obstacles to free trade amongst the provinces, we'd probably all be better off as well, because God knows I'd like to get some good craft beer from over your way. And I got some friends who are in the craft brew business who could send you some stuff their way. Fair enough. Um, and if I was to comment on that, I, I agree completely. We, we've had some good discussions about the Atlantic kind of, uh, um, I don't know if Atlantic prosperity revival or cooperative revival, but what I've seen during this session with the national calls is an unprecedented national unity, even even from Quebec. So so that was novel because I hadn't seen that as a nation us pulling together in this in this particular situation. So nothing like a good crisis to give every, give everyone focused. So so it has allowed us to think more about what what vulnerability do we have as a nation? What vulnerability do we have as an Atlantic region? And then we started talking about the food security issues. Well what are we producing collectively around us here? Uh, what can we do more of? Because we have had an autonomy here individually that has prevented any sort of real exposure or growth in that cooperation. And it's happened with every every province, no matter who's in political office, you know, they're there for their own province. And, and yes, we'll make a decision, but it has to be best for, for our own province or we can't make it. So, so that's a difficult discussion, which I'll use an example that's only heightened by the political shifts every four years. And, and so it never gets a long-term focus. So I'm, I came from a world where it was always based on a continuous improvement model. And it was always based on a, a skill set where people are continuing to learn and grow and get better. And they keep evolving. Well, unfortunately, democracy doesn't allow that because we bring in new players every so often with a complete new set of objectives, most of them all politically motivated. So it doesn't have that sort of focus on, okay, where did the other one leave off that I can start to build on. Oh no, whatever the last person did isn't anything I want to follow, so I'll do something all by myself. My complete biggest focus has been to reorganize how government works. And government, when I'm talking about government, it's the internal mechanisms of the bureaucracy. What we found through this pandemic have been, has been tremendous talent that has been hidden because, because it, 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 it isn't connected because of the political process. So I've been trying to separate. Now this is maybe an interesting process because I get into some pretty good debate with my colleagues on this, but I'm trying to separate the service delivery model from the policy development model. So basically in the system, if, if uh, we have deputy ministers or we have CEOs uh, responsible for a division, let's say it's healthcare, then I wanna know how well that division is performing in every hospital in the province. I wanna know what our, what our wait times are, how many patients are not able to have primary care, what, what wait times for, for surgeries are, and which hospitals are better, and what the ER numbers are, and are they looking uh, high or low, and, and where are we dealing with the, uh, with the outliers? But we don't have that type of capability because that doesn't come with any government. But it should come with the ability that, that's in the civil service to manage better the service delivery and taxpayer dollars. 
So we're trying to develop uh, report cards and scorecards that, that, that we can pass on to the next government and say, this is what's how things are going in education. This is how things are going in health. This is what's happened in social development. Then you take that and move the next step into the provincial portions of, of our Atlantic region. Just, just this week, I was questioned because we're, we had a very unfortunate incident in a shooting in the northern part of the province that's being investigated. And I was asked in the, in the college, why don't we have our own special uh, investigative force here to do this? Well, we, we went to Nova Scotia because they've done it before, but, but unfortunately, they've, they're busy too. And, and um, so we have the, the uh, group from Quebec in now doing analysis and independent review of what happened. I said, why do I need my own? Why don't we have one Atlantic um, security service here that provide this level of, of investigation independently? I don't need my own. Well, we think we should have. So that's the philosophy. We need to build more. No, I don't agree with that. So how many more of those things can we do? The calls that we've had through this pandemic have forced us to think about that. And I just hope that we, we, we can keep that momentum. And it's going to be I'm challenging. Gonna, I'm going to jump in here. Because um, you guys have completely hijacked the format for my debate. <laughs> <laughs> was that a, so that was that's a okay. I, I had intended to sort of leave myself out and let you have the exchange of ideas because that's what this is about. It's a respectful um, you know, exchange of ideas as opposed to what you typically see on social media these days. But the, the one question I think that's top of mind for a lot of people as we're reopening the economy is the fact that you know we have not cured COVID-19. There is no vaccination or vaccine that's going to you know, protect us. I, I did hear on CBC Radio this morning that there are three things that we need to do you know, to protect ourselves as we move forward. One is the wearing of masks. The other is maintaining a level of distance. And the third thing was consistent, constant hand washing. I will say, even at the level we are at now, a tremendous number of people are ignoring the need or re friendly request to wear masks and to maintain distance. When you're out getting groceries or doing any level of shopping, you are going to meet people who are resentful of that. How do we protect people moving forward uh, so that we can reopen the economy? And you know, do we need more stringent mechanisms in place that force people to adhere to those kinds of safety measures? And Ed, I'm gonna let you answer that first. I, I spent about 20 years working with and for the medical regulator in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. So I'm, I'm more than passionately familiar with um, some of the basics of public health it was one of my one of my bosses was a was a former deputy minister of, of health and he was a, a big advocate of the simple stuff 20 to 30 seconds of, of of hand washing vigorous hand washing solves all sorts of things it's not just covid it's all sorts of diseases and illnesses that get passed around i think the issue here is not that we need to have a regime of of of, of strict rules and adherence but a set of simple robust guidelines that people follow so as I said earlier, I have my mask in my pocket so that if I find myself in a situation where I need it, I put it on. And when provinces start talking about levels and alert levels and so on, if we developed, for example, a, a, something that's like a pollen forecast that says right now in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Campbellton, since you use that example, or if I'm in Edmonston uh, right now, the threat level is, is, is two. Uh, but if I'm in, I mean, if I'm in, um, in, in Moncton, it's it's one, and I'm in St. John, it's five. Then, if I'm living in those communities or traveling in those communities, I will make those adaptations myself. I think that's more the sense we have to have. And the challenge for the local health authorities or the local public health authorities is being able to develop that kind of knowledge or that kind of sense about it. And then the rest of us will carry on and we'll get used to dealing with it. But that's, I think, how we'll go about our lives. Darwin will take care, hopefully, of the rest of them, unfortunately, but we'll have to deal with those too. And I think, in practical terms, if you look in Newfoundland and Labrador, people tell me, I have traveled very much. Outside St. John's, where there hasn't been very much illness, nobody wears a mask, nobody's doing anything, but then again, they don't need to. However, when this all started and nobody knew where it was coming from, they closed their windows, they closed their doors, they kept 10 feet away from people. And if wearing a mask was the least thing they had to do, they wouldn't complain. I think people react much better than we give them credit for. Mr. Premier, I'll, uh, you have the uh, final remarks here today. So, so I, I agree. I think people will react and be responsible. I mean, we do have the outliers, but, but the, for the most part, we can never enforce this uh, to the degree of, of um, you know, full, full protection. 
we have to rely on individuals. I've, I've said that most often in, in my press releases and to, to every day updating on COVID. It, it's, uh, it's, it's like uh, we, people need to respect each other. They need to have a respect for seniors. They need to have a respect for those that are more vulnerable in this process. And, and we get on with our business. I, I think it, it, it's basic common sense. We're going to learn this is going to become a way of life until there's a vaccine. We might as well get used to it. We need to get back into life as, as normal as we can at this point. You know, have the mask with us. Be, be cognizant of that. And say to people, and uh, to making people aware, because I know uh, Ed made a comment earlier, you know, about the, the yeah, we wear it in government if, if we have a problem. That's the nature of the business we're in. But there is a responsibility here that we have to take. And I got to say that going with the COVID cabinet committee that we've had and the other three leaders being part of that with me, it's allowed us to decide on what made sense. And then there wasn't, we weren't out there sniping at each other about what didn't make sense. And that has been a major benefit to, to how we've managed this process in New Brunswick. It only gives you a signal of what is possible if politicians can collectively get their act together. Well, thank you both very much for your time. I've really appreciated your participation in the very first episode of the Dawn Debate. <laughs> thank you, Dawn. I enjoyed it as well. Thanks, Thanks very much for having us. It's thank great. you. Ed. Take care. You too.